Eagle 95.1, WUPN, Paradise, Sault Ste. Marie. It's time for the game. Eagle 95.1 proudly brings you the game. The Twin Zoo's only regional and national sports show. For the next hour, we'll get an in-depth look at sports in the Eastern Upper Peninsula and Algoma region and hear from coaches and players involved in the game. Now, let's join Scott Nason at the Wicked Sister on Ashman Street in downtown Sioux St. Marie, Michigan for tonight's broadcast of the game on Eagle 95.1. Time to play the game. Time to play the game! <laughs> Glorious! No, I won't give in, I won't give in till I'm victorious! And I will defend, I will defend! Salutations and welcome to the game on this special Tuesday night edition. Scott Nason broadcasting from the studios of Eagle 95.1 on this Tuesday, April 3rd, 2018. Uh, Looking outside the window right now, we were expected to get quite a bit of snow. The snow has not started yet, which I'm very happy with because we have enough, okay? Enough of the snow. A couple special guests tonight, including the gentleman that we'll get to in a moment, Dave McKegg. We also have Butch Davis from the Telegram News and Butch on Sports and Steve Bigelow, excuse me, Dr. Steve Bigelow, uh, one of my longtime friends. He's a superintendent of Bay City Schools. He went to University of Michigan. He's a big Michigan guy. We're going to talk to uh, Mr. Bigelow, excuse me, Dr. Bigelow, about his thoughts on last night's game with the Michigan Wolverines losing to Villanova and also kind of from a superintendent of schools perspective as far as uh, sports in high schools in general but without further ado let's get to our co-host of the game he is also host of the game sports show from Sports Center Bar and Grill in Sioux Ontario on Wednesday nights and host of the game sports show from Boston Pizza on Thursday night. He's a busy man, busiest man in show business. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Oh. Dave McKeg. Dave, how you doing tonight, sir? I love your introductions at all times. And Scotty, I got to say flat out, it's been too long, my friend, since you and I have had a, a show together. That really has. Uh, due to holidays, yesterday being Easter Monday, the Wicked Sister being closed, and due to other broadcasts and other commitments, our normal Monday nights are going to be interrupted for a little bit. Uh, coming up here probably in May, we'll have a few Mondays where we won't be able to do the show due to yours truly umpiring. And you look outside right now, Dave, it seems like it's the furthest thing from as far as starting the local sports season in the spring. So we don't have anything to talk about there. But Dave, we do have lots to talk about in the world of hockey. So let's get right to it before we get to Butch Davis coming up here around at 7.15. Uh, First of all, let's talk about the NOJHL. Uh, When we last had our show, you guys talked about it on Thursday on the game sports show from Boston Pizza, the Sioux Eagles. Fell to the Sioux Thunderbirds in Game 7 at the John Rhodes last Wednesday night by the score of 4-3 to three as Nick Smith, or excuse me, 3-2 to two as Nick Smith broke a 2-2 deadlock in the third period as the Eagles and Thunderbirds went the full tilt. And it was the goal tearing of Eric Shook that really was the difference in the series. Eagles goaltender Carter McPhail, he played outstanding as well. But Shook came into that game four late, and you really got to like that call by Coach John Parko. Uh, the Th- Thunderbirds were down 3-1, to one, and many people thought, boy, you know, maybe this series is over. But Shook came in, and he shut the door against the Sioux Eagles as the Thunderbirds advanced to the NLJHL's Western Division Finals, which we'll get to in, in a moment, Dave. But... You know, you said it, Brad said it, I said it. It was going to be a seven-game series, and really it was one goal that made the difference. A great border battle once again, Dave. 
Oh, absolutely. You know, as to be expected, obviously, right? And as you just mentioned with yourself, Brad, and myself, and probably the entire panel of the Game Sports Show, and probably the Twin Sues are predicting that, uh, and anyone who's an NHL fan predicting that that would be a seven-game series. That was a very exciting series. The Polar Stadium was uh, well-packed. The John Rhodes was absolutely packed. Uh, the, the the border battle is in full flight, I guess, between the Eagles and Thunderbirds, all pun intended there. And between the Thunderbirds and Eagles, you know, the Thunderbirds are down 3-1. And, you know, a, a friend of mine, uh, Jaron Rowe's brother, Austin Rowe, who is a member of the Sioux Eagles, you know, when they were up 3-1, I know Jaron was telling me that Austin was saying, you know what, the series is not done. The series is not done. And we were continuously saying that as well. And the Thunderbirds battled back to force that game seven, as everyone expected. And being, you know, down in, down and coming back up and winning that series, that's crucial. That is a big momentum booster. And it all started with them believing uh, and being based on what I've dug up with the team and some insiders on the team, that they didn't count themselves out. They went to practice and work just as hard. They didn't change anything. Uh, they just had their mindset continue to f- and focus to win and come back and win that series against a very talented and hardworking Eagle squad and also very well-coached Eagle squad by Jim Cappy as well. And you know what? It's a series that the Eagles probably would like to restart or go back to that game five when they're up 3-1 in the series. However, you know what? It is how it ended, and it was a fantastic series over. Overall, and the Eagles should be very proud of what this season has got to them. It is a disappointing loss to be up and lose like that. That is to be understood. But at the end of the day, these are two talented teams, extremely talented teams. And it doesn't matter if you're up 3-1, you're down 3-0, if you're whatever the series is, it, this proves that a series is never over until that final buzzer. And this was truly uh, probably going to be the most entertaining series uh, in the NLJHL playoffs, in my opinion. The Thunderbirds advance, Dave, to the Western Division Finals, where they have already started that series against Rayside Bell for the Thunderbirds won game one on Friday night by the score of two to nothing. Eric Shook once again outstanding, stopping all 32 shots in that game. And then on Saturday, the Rayside Bell four Canadians come back and they win a game in overtime three to two as Kyle Linema scored his second goal of the game to tie that series at one game apiece. Games three and four will be in Sault Ste. Marie. Game three will be at the John Rhodes Community Center tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, and then game four on Thursday night at 7 o'clock. And uh, one of the things that happened, Dave, in that game one, I don't know if you had a chance to see the replay of it, but right off the faceoff, and we've seen this Rayside Balfour team this year. They're a very physical team. Some might call them a bit chippy, a bit dirty, but there was an incident that happened right as that game started in game one as one of the Rayside Belfour Canadians players, James White, suspended indefinitely after uh, a hit which happened off the faceoff, what was judged as a blindsided hit against Cameron Baber, uh, the young Sioux Thunderbirds player who was out of part of that series against the Sioux Eagles, and I thought he was a big difference in that series with the Thunderbirds winning those final three games. Well, unfortunately for Mr. Baber, he is likely out for the series and the playoffs as he received another concussion. I know I saw quite a bit on Twitter over the weekend of uh, people saying that it was a legal hit, it wasn't a legal hit. Um, There was no penalty called on the play, which... That surprises me, and, you know, any time now, Dave, it's a little different from when you played. It's certainly a lot different back in the day where those hits were commonplace. Those hits happened all the time. Nobody even thought too much of it, but with now, with the even junior hockey really changing over the past, in my opinion, 10 years, getting away from that sort of physical contact, getting away from those hits up high, and especially when it's the head involved, it's a very different hockey game. I don't know what's going to happen to Mr. White. Uh, Likely he's going to be suspended at least through this series, possibly the whole playoffs. Dave, did you have a chance to see it? And if so, what are your thoughts? You know, Scott, you actually took the thought right from me there. And you know what? We're on the same page with this. I did get a chance to see uh, the replay. I actually saw it with a friend of mine, uh, Anthony Miller, one of my coworkers, whom is Joey Miller's cousin, who showed me on the phone, asked if I saw the hit. It was the day right after I saw it, and I stated how I heard about it just through social media, but never had a chance to see a video. And when I saw the video, Scotty, I, 
I'm going to tell you, I was the word I want to use, and I hope it's okay, is disgusted. That is yeah. that is the word I like to use. Uh, and I can tell you right now, confirm that uh, Cameron Baber has suffered uh, has suffered a third degree concussion, uh, which is the worst, uh, one of the worst, to, or is the worst. I'm not an expertise of the PhD whatsoever, but you know, from what I understand, that he he is for sure out for the season. This can actually potentially end his season next year, or even complicate his hockey career going forward. Wow. Uh, so. Um, like we hope that's not the case. That's worst case scenario. But when you have a third degree concussion, those are extremely difficult to come back from. Look at guys like Eric Lindros. Yes, I'm comparing to NHL players here, but when you have that type of brain, uh, kind of injury, uh, when you keep suffering more hits and keep taking more hits on the boards, the slightest rattle along the boards can re-trigger another minor concussion, another minor than another major. It's just, it's like a ticking time bomb when it comes to that. So I can tell you right now that he is certainly out for the playoffs and you'd be very surprised if he even played hockey next season. And if he does, I, and I most certainly hope he does. Uh, but you know, from all we can do right now is wish the best going forward for him. But that hit, I can tell you right now, Scotty was absolutely dirty. And I am disgusted. And I can, you were right. I played at a time, uh, even a bit before my time when I was watching that uh, back in the earlier NOJHL days and I was younger and even playing it, like I said, the game didn't change from when I was 10 years old watching it to when I played, to be honest. I feel the game started changing when I was 20. Uh, that, I believe that was 2011. I'm going to go back uh, seven years. 2011 was my last year, and that's when the league started to evolve in more of a faster-paced game, less body checks. Uh, people were skating with their heads down more, and I've never seen a lot of circumstances in games in my senior year, you know, that people, I can tell you, my rookie year would have absolutely got rocked by guys like Trent Lindsay, uh, Mike Bondy, Bronson Kovacs, especially, just to name a few guys. Jerry Patingolo, one of my best friends who certainly knew how to lay the body. You know, the, the game was more of a two-way rough hockey back then. Not saying we weren't talented. It was, I think, we had talent. We had the whole package. I'm not... I'm also not criticizing saying they're not talented, these guys. It's just more of a faster game than what it was um, back previously. And simply put, like the, this kind of stuff did happen when I played. and But it was more in a cleaner fashion. The guy was skating with, the, with his head down through the middle. Those are... Those are hits back then that we thought were sort of dirty, but truly they weren't. They were clean, open ice hits. The hits that were suffered and I saw back when I played or back in the earlier NOJHL days, these hits were hard, bone-crushing hits that were actually clean hits. The only kind of dirty hits that occurred in the NOJHL previously were hit from behinds, which actually still occurs. So those are the type of hits that you saw were dirty. But if you would have saw this type of hit, when I played, I can tell you right now there would have been a bench clearing brawl. I guarantee, I guarantee you that, 100%. Uh, nobody would have gone away unscathed. Uh, I'm putting a lot of ownership on the referees. I cannot recall who the referees are, but I'm not going to obviously bash the referee. But how they missed that and how they figured that that's a clean hit, it is absolutely not. Um, the individual on race side de- definitely deserves uh, a suspension, in my opinion, right, uh, respectively put, as I feel it was a very extremely disgusting hit. And as I mentioned, it has changed this game between bef- now and before. And you don't see these types of hits anymore. When they are occurring, they, they're mostly talked about. And you never even saw this even before in the NOJHL days. You just saw clean bone crushing hits. These are the type of hits that they want to take out of the game in all sports. They want to take it out of hockey. They want to take it out of football either. All these blind side hits and the hits when, uh, if I recall correctly, would see in the video, the puck was nowhere in sight. Uh, it, it's nowhere, nowhere, nowhere in sight. And myself, how the Sioux Thunderbirds didn't react instantly. Maybe players didn't see it. I'm not too sure, but I can guarantee you as soon as I would have saw my fallen comrade on the ice, I would have known where the puck was. I would have known what would have happened. You assess that. They're smart kids. I wouldn't have even thought about the game. You know, you grab the guy, you, you get that energy back and that's the kind of way it was before. Nowadays in hockey, you can't really do that. But, you know, maybe someone to drop the, the gloves with the individual, show that emotion right after because, you know, that was a hit that shouldn't have happened, was extremely dirty, uh, was unexpected. And obviously it may end, uh, worst case scenario, uh, a fine young hockey player's career potentially. We hope not. We hope he is back next year or even, uh, the year after potentially. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, we're worried about the now. We're worried about him getting his health back in order and getting his life together. Cause ultimately still, this is junior A hockey. This is someone trying to make a stepping stone in a career and to also maybe build a, a, sc- a scholarship towards hockey. But most importantly, they're developing skills in life by playing hockey here and social abilities that's going 
going to benefit them going forward. And having these types of dirty plays is not what you would do off the ice. You do it on the ice to set the tone and make yourself look big. I call it a coward hit, which is my favorite word to use uh, on the show in a lot of ways. I've described a lot of individuals and plays the word coward. So I think this was a coward hit and also a disgusting hit. And I'm, I think it's a deserved suspension and, and out indefinitely. I would consider not having him in the league any longer because those are the type of hits that are no longer fit in the game. Dave McKegg joining us here in the first segment of the game. The other series in the NLJHL, Cochrane and Timmins. Cochrane up 2-1. to one. Timmins winning last night by the score of 2 to nothing. Game 4 tomorrow night in Timmins. Uh, real quick, wanted to get to a couple Lake State athletics before we end this segment with the Greyhounds. And last week, Dave had former Laker Owen Hedrick on his show, the Game Sports Show from Boston Pete's. And you can find that show and all the Game Sports Shows in two places, thegamesportshow.com or the game sports show dot podbean dot com got lots of hits for that broadcast dave very good job as always laker spring athletics are underway they did collect four first place finishes in their first meet of the season this past thursday at the saint norbert twilight meet as the laker men finished fourth out of eight teams teams rather the women finished sixth play sophomores kai hymanen and roger wilford led the way for the lakers in the field events each bringing home a first place finish hymanen had the top mark and the javelin throw while wilford was first in the high jump jack miles had lssu's best performance of the day on the track in the 10,000 meter that's a long way to top the field on the women's side freshman ashley mullings placed first in the long jump Posting a career best mark, freshman Riley Collins and senior Sarah Schweider tied for the top mark in a high jump. The Lakers are back in action this weekend as they travel to Michigan State to take part in the Auto Owners Spartan Invitational. And the Laker men's tennis team won a big match on the road at Michigan Tech on Saturday as they down the Huskies 7-2 to to even their mark at 6-6. Six and six. And they're going to be at home this weekend for a two-match homestand as they'll take on Davenport on Saturday and per- Purdue University Northwest on Sunday. The matches usually start around 9, 10 a.m., free and open to the public. So if you want to come on in, get out from all the cold and see some great college tennis, you can see that at the <coughs> Student Activity Center coming up this weekend. Dave, we got about five minutes to talk about the Sioux Greyhounds. Well, they haven't played for a while as they swept their series to no one's surprise, over Saginaw winning their last game by the score of 5-3 to three last Wednesday. And so the Hounds do know who their opponent will be in the semifinals of the Western Conference. They will take on the Owen Sound Attack as the Attack swept their series against London. A little bit of a surprise there, maybe that they didn't win, but that they swept London. And so that series will start Thursday at the SR Center. Game two set for Friday night at the SR Center. Games three and four will be at Owen Sound next Monday and a week from Wednesday. And if there's a game five necessary, it'll be in the Sioux on Friday, April 13th. The other Western semifinal, no surprise, Kitchener will take on Sarnia in the East. Hamilton, they will take on Niagara, while Barry will take on Kingston. We're going to talk more about the Hounds and Hockey Night in Canada coming up with Butch here. But uh, Dave, about three minutes to talk about the Hounds. No one's surprised they're moving on, and I just have a hard time seeing this team even lose maybe a game in a playoff series, let alone a best-of-seven series. What's your thoughts over there on the Hounds? Oh, absolutely. It's 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 absolute uh, chaos over here in the Sioux with excitement. You know, that this is a team that is built to win and win now, obviously. And then we had, a, we had a great last five years, a couple years ago, having the team with Richie and D'Angelo. We thought that was potentially the year, but this is different with this team uh, in terms of the talent that's on the ice and the terms, uh, the way that we're seeing them play last series was absolutely stellar against Saginaw. I know we're going to get to another point that I wasn't uh, too fond of in terms of the Hounds with that, but the Sault Ste. Marie grounds going through Saginaw, I actually felt that maybe Saginaw would actually get a game in on the Hounds because of them uh, battling them hard all year uh, and with the hounds you know sweeping Saginaw like I said was sort of not I shouldn't say surprised but I thought Saginaw maybe like I said come away with the game but this is going to be a tougher series against Owen Sound Owen Sound should not be taken lightly uh, but to see the hounds lose seven game or lose four games or lose an ex- lose in a seven game series I can't see that happening like you said Scott I th- this team is just too well put together up front 
back end and goaltending that it's absolutely amazing. But it's nothing against uh, the uh, remaining teams, which we know in Salem Kitchener and also Sarnia from the side of the conference. But at the end of the day, this team is fantastic. And we're here in Sault Ste. Marie excited to get ready for round two as the quest for Memorial, uh, the, the OHL championship and Memorial Cup continues. And they've obviously shown the supremacy last series, absolutely thumping Saginaw, uh, except the last game was a little bit closer, obviously. But going into the second round here in the second series, like I said, the Hounds should not take it lightly. They have to battle each game and they have to play and stick to their, you know, stick to the system, you know, stick to what they've been doing and also uh, not take a team like lightly is the most important thing. I stress that and I can't stress that enough that, you know, these are young kids that might get a little bit ahead of themselves, but I trust the coaching staff and management there to keep the kids in line and to also ensure that this team stays focused because Owen Sound is going to put up a good series. But going forward, I couldn't agree more, Scott. I can't see a team defeating these guys in a seven-game series. I just I just can't picture it. But hockey's a strange game, and anything can happen. You wouldn't call uh, the Sioux Greyhounds, quote, a bunch of hot dogs, unquote, would you, Dave? No, I definitely wouldn't call them hot dogs. I think that was a little too far, and I know we're going to get to that. But, you know, they... I, they're not a bunch of hot dogs. I use the term of hot dogs as if they're in general hot dogs, uh, like in terms of and as personality on and off the ice if they do it continuously. Uh, this was one game that was uh, their first national, I believe. I believe it was the first game or maybe the second game that was on national television here on Sportsnet. Yeah, Motions two. are running high. Game two was, so motions are running high. Uh, and also these kids may not get a chance on national TV. There's a lot of factors, but these kids are not hot dogs. Absolutely not. They may have acted, but they're definitely not. That's the quote I'm going to use. That's a little, little tease to what we'll get into with Butch, as uh, I'm sure many of our listeners already know. Actually, I didn't know about this until earlier today, but on Hockey Night in Canada on Saturday... I was watching NCAA basketball, so I happened to miss it. Uh, Don Cherry, a well-known, well-known commentator for Hockey Night in Canada, one of my favorite commentators, I might add. He had some choice words towards the end of his Coach's Corner segment about that uh, incident that happened. I wouldn't say incident, but what happened at the end of Game 2. The Hounds up 6 to nothing, and they had a couple goals at the end that were highlight reel goals. And they celebrated like they were highlight real goals and well Don Cherry and labeled uh, that a a bunch of hot dogs as he said during his segment and and was very critical about it Uh, he said he went on to say there's not enough mustard in the world to cover these guys granted he's talking about 16 to 20 year old junior hockey players which I have a problem with right there but and we'll get to that more but he said that hockey gods and karma get people like this how could these guys do this thing to this goaltender the poor kid, his parents are watching. Uh, and, and Ron McClain chimed in a little bit, and then he said, kids, you never do that, never be a hot dog and karma kind of uh, player, and it comes and gets back to you. So, uh, Dave, we're going to go to break on that, and when we get back after our break, we'll talk to Butch Davis from the Telegram News and Butch on Sports. We'll get into our roundtable where I know you have a lot to say, and uh, I say we start with that topic. What say you, sir? Oh, absolutely. It's definitely the hot topic, especially over here in Sault Ste. Marie with uh, a well-respected hockey figure and somebody who actually used to run or actually have a Don Cherry's restaurant here in Sault Ste. Marie that lasted under six months, which is also an interesting twist on the story. Absolutely. Dave, we're going to take a break and come back with Butch Davis from the Telegram News and Butch on Sports. That's coming up next on The Game here on Eagle 95.1. Get wicked at the Wicked Sister. You'll find the best tasting food for the whole family. Start off with some appetizers like the crab dip served with warm non-bread strips and soft pretzel bites or their antibiotic and hormone-free boneless chicken wings with five choices of sauces. Entrees include the barbecue pork pork sandwich, the number one selling drunken cow burger, or Philly cheesesteaks, and they're on special all day Thursdays. The Wicked Sister also offers a gluten-free menu and catering. Bring the whole family. The Wicked Sister, downtown Ashman Street, open seven days a week. The Game Sports Show would like to thank an additional home to the Game Sports Show, Canadian franchise Boston Pizza. Boston Pizza, Sault Ste. Marie, located on 601 Great Northern Road, Sault Ste. Marie. Come in and join Boston Pizza for its numerous specials that are offered. After 9 p.m. daily, come in to Boston Pizza for $9 schooners, $4 rail drinks, and delicious food. Boston Pizza, Sault Ste. Marie, you're among friends.
welcome back to the game on Eagle 95.1. Scott Mason broadcasting from the studios on Ashman Street on this wintry Tuesday night in Sault Ste. Marie. We're continued to be joined by Dave McKegg from Sioux, Ontario, who joined us during the first segment, and he's joining us for the roundtable portion. We're kind of mixing up the order because Dave has to get going here at the bottom of the hour, but we are joined right now here in our roundtable by Dave, myself, and Butch Davis from the Telegram News and Butch on Sports. As Butch joins us each and every week to examine the Metro Detroit sports scene as well as other related sports topic. Butch, I hope it's a lot warmer where you're at. How you doing tonight, my friend? It's 33 degrees and raining hard with thunderstorm. Yikes. Yeah. We're going to get spring, Butch. That's my first question. I don't know the until it comes. Shoot. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, Butch, we're going to start with the round table, and I, I kind of want to pick up where Dave and I were talking uh, during our last segment. It has to do with our local hockey team, the Sioux Greyhounds, and it has to do with Don Cherry, somebody I know you're very familiar with. So I want to get you up to speed on what happened with the Greyhounds and with Don Cherry. Well, as you know, Butch, Don Cherry is on Hockey Night in Canada, and during the intermission he has a segment called Coach's Corner. Towards the end of this Saturday's Coach's Corner, he and had I saw some uh, choice words to say about the Sioux Greyhounds, uh, the local <laughs> team. Obviously, we follow up here. You're very familiar with Butch. Uh, in their game two, in their sweep over the Saginaw Spirit, there were a couple goals towards the end of that game. It was an 8 nothing game, and you probably saw the highlights. It actually made ESPN's top plays on mm-hmm. SportsCenter. And uh, during this segment, uh, Don Cherry labeled the Hounds, quote, a bunch of hot dogs. During this segment, he was very critical of the way the Hounds ran up the score in celebrating their late goals following the 8-0 victory over Saginaw on March 25th, which was a national televised game. Um, He went on to say, Don Cherry went on to say, quote, hockey gods and karma get people like this. How could these guys Mm. do this thing to this goaltender, the poor kid? His parents are watching. Kids, you never do that. Never be a hot dog. And karma always comes back to you. Now, head coach Drew Bannister here locally in the media uh, had some choice words for Don Cherry. He says, quote, I don't think he watched the hockey game. I think he only saw the highlights. He went on to say, if we didn't come out and play hard in the third period and we let them back into the game, we would have been lambasted by the media for taking our foot off the pedal. He went on to say, uh, I played this game and I speak from experience. Those goals were on the spur of the moment. And how can you not celebrate goals like this? And uh, he also went on to uh, be a little critical of Don Cherry and his rock'em sock'em type of uh, videos and and ways that he talks about promoting fighting in the words of Mr. Bannister. So, Butch, I'm going to throw it to you. Don't know if you heard about that, but what are your thoughts on that whole topic? Well, I actually did see the whole interview Saturday, okay, during the first intermission and whatnot, and it was pretty hilarious there, you know. You don't get to championship level by sitting taking your foot off the pedal there and exactly. taking everything light and easy here. And I think Mr. Cherry had too much cherry in his punch or something. <laughs> I don't maybe it's the wrong suit and co cocked him. I don't know. I really don't know, but I did hear the comment and he was pretty vivid on the word using the word hot dog, okay? And I didn't see nothing wrong with Sue. Doing what they did, they were having fun. They were enjoying themselves. Uh, they seemed to be a pretty supreme hockey team, for what I saw on ESPN when they picked up those pucks and kind of whipped them in the net where nobody knew where the heck it was. And uh, I, I tell you, you know, some people get paid by making everybody else's life very miserable here. And I don't know if it's Don is having a that role or something or whatever it may be, but I think the words were just very much so out of place there, okay? You know, I like his rock'em sock'em, what he calls a, a hilarious kind of attitude there, you know, and um, he's pro this and pro that, and, uh, you know, he speaks very highly of the Army, the Navy, the Armed Forces, the works, uh, but sometimes... This game is not about, you know, how many people you can put in the hospital. This game is about having fun. And when you take the fun out of the bad boy here, it's really, it's not too much you look for there. But, well, poor Don Cherry, you know, let's send him some, uh, I don't know, a pillow or something here so you can think about it. I don't know what to tell you. 
Dave, uh, you and I were talking about that off the air uh, before we went on the air about Don Cherry. Uh, possibly you're, you're, you're trying to see and work your connections to get him on one of your shows in Sioux, Ontario. And, and I'm just going to chime in real quick before we get to you, Dave. Uh, you know, I guess the I don't agree with Don Cherry in this. I mean, the Hounds have so much talent that they can do these sort of things. Drew Bannister isn't the type of coach that's going to run up the score on someone, but you're in the playoffs. I mean, you're fighting to get to the Memorial Cup. I mean, the Hounds are dying for a Memorial Cup. It's been 25 years, and they are built to win this year. And so I don't have a problem with what they did because of the scenario. I didn't think it was anything where they were running up the score. The fact is they just have a lot of talent and a lot of players that you're going to see very soon in the NHL, several players, and that are going to be very good players in the NHL. And the thing I don't like that Don Cherry did is we're talking about 16 to 20-year-old kids, and many of these guys, 18, 17, 18, 19, and they're having fun. And really, to me, that's kind of why you play the game, to have fun. I don't think they were rubbing in on anybody's faces or anything like that. I mean, could they maybe have taken exception if you're Saginaw? Sure, but you know what? You got swept, so it is what it is. You have winners, you have losers. There's no participation medals in the Ontario Hockey League. Dave, I know you got a lot to say. Your thoughts before we get back to Butch and his topic. You know, absolutely. Like we had tested to before we went to the break here, Scott. Like with Don Cherry, I he used. I don't think it was the. I'm gonna say right off the hop. I don't think it was the, the his scrutiny that he didn't like how they ran up the score. You know, people are gonna have their opinion. It is the comments after the fact saying the karma comment also stating there's not enough mustard in the world to cover these guys that is what mostly upsets Sault Ste. Marie I can tell you that right now uh, that is the terms that that they didn't really like to hear from a lot from an individual that a lot of individuals here in Sault Ste. Marie looked up to here's a guy that came here when he coached for Mississauga we gave him a standing ovation his last game uh, last coaching and we also had uh, we had him we gave him a warm welcome here he also had a restaurant here that didn't add like didn't last man <laughs> Uh, and maybe he's a little sour about that as well. I don't even think it lasted six months. But at the end of the day, we gave him respect, and he's looked up to as a, as a hockey model in terms of his Rock'em Sock'em videos. Coach's Corner, that is his theme song for Coach's Corner, defines hockey night in Canada a whole lot, especially when the Leafs are, so, are playing on that Saturday. So that respect, in terms of him having his, his, uh, his outlook, in terms of how – they were maybe shouldn't have ran up that score or he didn't like how they showboated. That I don't think is the point that people are upset about. People have their opinion. It's the comments afterwards. Okay. The not enough mustard in the world, the, the karma, that is what has been each repeated comment on Facebook. When everyone has shared, they put those comments in there. So based on what I see on social media and discussing with individuals here in Sault Ste. Marie, that is what upset everybody. And Don and Jerry, I don't think those are comments that you should have said. I know you are a guy of freedom of speech. You don't really think a lot before it talks, it seems, when it comes to a lot when you rant, but that's totally fine. Uh, you, ha- you have the right to your opinion. So my comment back to Don Cherry on this topic is simple. These kids are 16 to 20 years old in the OHL and Major Junior, and uh, you know they were on national television on the Sunday game on Sportsnet, a game that I actually ho- – I was – Upset that was televised because it was an eight nothing shellacking, you know. But the, the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds are the best team in Canada. They have the fifty five seven and six record this year. Just an absolutely remarkable campaign. So why wouldn't these guys get that publicity? And speaking of that, these are young kids that you know are not going to let their foot off the gas because it is playoff hockey. Ultimately, you're going to play from the beginning whistle to the last whistle. And if I was Bannister, if they did in the third period, but let their foot off the gas, I would bench players. I'd be upset. I would bag skate them the next the next day. It doesn't matter. You know, you're going to play until the final buzzer. And I will say that what they did, these, uh, these younger, these young teens, I would say that are mid late teens, what these kids did are obviously in terms of beating the heat of the moment. Obviously, they celebrated. They pulled off goals that they probably wouldn't do in a 2-2 game. I understand that. you know. But in terms of being that, I will say that the celebrations I don't think was necessary, to be honest. I don't think it was. Uh, the goals, were they necessary? Sure. It's, again, heat of the moment. You know, if they had the opportunity to do it, maybe they did it. Or maybe they wouldn't have done a 2-2 game. It doesn't matter. I am not a fan of celebrating uh, after when you have a big lead. I never was. That's how coaches has taught me. And a big coach with that was Jim Cappy and Don Gagne, to be totally honest, who spent six years coaching me. So I can I can tell you from experience, that's the way I was taught with upbringing. But when I scored a goal, a very nice goal, I would celebrate. Uh, but with having... 
I, I see like Kapaka, for example, looking and chirping that guy after he slid. That is not necessary. It isn't. It truly isn't. Show that emotion. Show that happiness that you scored the goal ultimately. But, you know, try not to celebrate like that. But again, on the catch 22 of it is they're on national television. These guys are playing junior hockey. They're the best team. They're, they're flowing right now. They're excited. They're happy. Sure. It wasn't necessary to showboat. Yes. I agree with that. I feel like they didn't have to do that. The goals were they necessary? Maybe, maybe not. I'm undecided with that. But Don Cherry, the topic that we're discussing here, calling them a bunch of hot dogs, calling them the none of mustard in the world, our karma is going to get them. That is completely disgusting to say about that. It does not define these kids. These are good kids. They do very good stuff in the community here in Sault Ste. Marie. And that one game doesn't define, that score doesn't define who they are as kids. These are young kids that are going to learn to mature and they're excited that they're winning the game. They're excited to score that big goal. Sure, like I said, to sum up everything, showboating was not necessary at that current time. And I, especially with Kapaka, I feel like that should have been, or um, I think I'm, I think I pronounced his last name wrong. I butcher a lot of last names, but I feel that they should have not done that, but at the end of the day, they did do it. And it doesn't make them bad or cocky hockey players. It, they're showing that emotion. They're happy to be there. They're showing their talent, and they should be enjoyed to watch. Don Cherry should have kept those last comments to himself, but him having a right to say that they showboated, he didn't like how they showboated, he should have left it at that. He didn't have to go into full details to after comments that are being scrutinized, and I'm hoping that he sends an apology here to Sault Ste. Marie for those comments after the fact. Uh, with the mustard and with the karma because that was completely unnecessary. Uh, sure, the kids' parents are watching, but they're watching a hockey team that is superior and also a very good hockey team that was caught up in the heat of the moment being on national television in the middle of an OHL playoff game. And obviously the excitement's there and the immaturity's there because these are kids. These are going to grow up eventually, but you know what? I'm happy the Hounds did what they did uh, in terms of, you know, playing hard to the final whistle. I wish they wouldn't have showboated, but I'm not upset that they did. I can understand because of being in those particular situations, you get excited. You scored a big goal in terms of how nice it was on a big goal in terms of being overtime, but a goal that was a highlight reel. Why not enjoy it and enjoy that moment, especially on national television? Let's, let's go to you next uh, for your topic. And uh, I know Dave mentioned that, you know, Don Cherry sometimes uh, goes on TV and, and, and speaks without thinking. Well, we have that in this country, too. It's called President Trump. So uh, but what's your topic <laughs> for tonight? You know, Dave, uh, you sure you got everything off your chest there? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I think I did. I even timed it. I was a little bit over my usual time limit. I don't like speaking that much, but, you know, you I like had to, had to be that much. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's a good one here. Uh, really, you, <laughs> you don't wish kids bad luck. Uh, you, you don't. Absolutely. We kids, All love to you. Right, Butch? That's right. You take care of the kids here, man. You, yeah, you whip absolutely. your parents and sports center. That's who you whip. Uh, anyway, <laughs> gosh. Oh, the, I'm quite sure everybody saw the play in the first game of the home opener, the Detroit Tigers here. And just a funny thing happened on the way to the road. It's a replay done with Snapu. Not even Snapu in baseball, but Snapu in in hockey and when Snapu in um in in the NCAA. It's when Snap Ben when Snapu in football here. Uh your opinions, boys and girls, on on and we're talking to men on the on this line here. Um, you know it's the replay. Well, Butch, you know, you brought this up several times on the roundtable, and I'm very curious to hear your thoughts being at the opener there for the Tigers. For those that didn't see or hear about the Tigers' home opener this past Friday, Tigers thought they won the game on a play at the plate. And after further review in the uh, latter stages there, uh, New York, I believe, is where the replay is uh, confirmed, if you will. And I don't know what they were looking at. I, I got to be honest. I, I saw the replays that uh, I'm sure Butch that you saw at the stadium. I'm sure that Dave and many others saw, like myself, watching on television. I didn't see it. I, I didn't see what what's what's the term in uh, in, substa- in, in in. You need proof. That's what I'm trying to look for. You need proof, visual evidence that it has to be maybe not without a shadow of a doubt, but it has to be a pretty good idea. If you're going to overturn something, it has to be more than if you keep the call as is. And, you know, Butch, you said it. We've seen a lot of cases where these instant replays just affect games and, in this case, affected outcomes. I mean, it's one game, but, you know, Ron Gardenhire got kicked out of the game, and I'm glad he did because he should have given uh holy heck and he did during that one but 
you know, to, to have a replay so much to affect a game like that is not what instant replay is for. I don't think instant replay is being used in the most effective manners. I, you know, you see so many of these games in basketball. I mean, geez, some of these last two minutes will end up being 20 minutes. And then we're not talking about timeouts and intentional fouls. We're talking about every time these guys go to the headset to see if it went off of this hand or went off of this knee or whatever. In hockey, we've seen several uh, instances of just reviews and, you know, what are you doing are we using technology too much? Should we just maybe take the judgment of the men and women that do the officiating on the field and just leave it at that? I don't know what the answer is. I think there has to be a combination of both. But, boy, instant replay right now over the past uh, months, and especially this Tigers game, Dave, uh, not not impressed at all. I, I'm very interested to hear what Butch has. But, Dave, we'll, we'll go to you real quick before we get to Butch. Your thoughts on uh, Butch's topic. You know, honestly, in general, just the replay has not been consistent in a lot of, you know, different sports, and not just in the world of baseball, and, but in the world of hockey, um, in the world of, you know, football, if you want to go there. It's just to say quickly, uh, since I'm probably still catching my breath here about that Don Cherry topic, uh, at the end of the day, the referees uh, the, or the umpires – need to get something straight. The leagues need to get something straight. Something needs to be done with these officiating calls after the math. And the consistency is the big factor in terms of the National Hockey League especially, but in terms of baseball, it's also that inconsistency and also those wrong calls. I feel uh, that baseball is a little bit of a different sport, though, in terms of it being – that's the uniqueness of baseball is that live action. It is being in that heat of the moment. That's the way the you know America's pastime has been with baseball. It's almost like it doesn't want to be changed by the public, but it needs to be changed. It needs to be focused that if there are going to be replays, if this is going to be a part of baseball, all sports need to get that this consistency, consistency down, especially in baseball. I feel it's a lot the worst, uh, you know. And I think at the end of the day, to get this fixed, it's the umpires getting on the same page, having being having develop communication skills and communication with the managers that are at the game, how they're going to call the game and keeping it consistent. That is the big word I'm going to use here is consistency involving the umps, involving the refs, whatever the sport may be. I'm kind of branch into all areas here, but at the end of the day, that consistency is huge. And I think with baseball, if they're going to follow that replay, if they're going to incorporate that and try to get it better, that's where they should start. Butch, uh, your thoughts. I know it must have been a very interesting press box at Cool America on Friday. Uh, your thoughts on your topic, sir? Yeah, you get to see everybody you haven't seen all year. <laughs> you know? Right. And, and then some here. Um, I had a good time. Um, you know, quickly, I'm just going to say it like it is here. I would love to see the film of what that person in New York saw that made him make that decision. Exactly. Uh, we still have not seen that yet. No one has seen it. So I'm going to say it like it is. New York made a great big mistake here, and I'd like to know how the accountability factor goes into play for these uh, gentlemen who make these decisions for Major League Baseball in Setakis, New York, okay? Being saying that here, there was no evidence, no inconclusive evidence. Um, I think that's what you were looking for. I thank that's you, Butch. I couldn't find that word. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I know you are very emotional here. <laughs> I can't find things. Either. I can't find my socks right now. Uh, you, know, <laughs> I, you know, I tell you, really and truly, um, they're going to have to be some brain work in here. There were many people going out to say and saying, you know, Las Las Vegas is involved. We're going to have days like this. Well, I don't want to be that harsh on this particular situation here, but it has to be some accountability on what you saw and whatever you saw. I think the general public needs to see it too. So they won't, you know, be forgiveness as maybe no one is at this present time here. There was a mistake made in that particular. We I saw where the club was waving toward the shirt sleeve, the bottom, butt bottom of a shirt sleeve here. And if that's the significant call, we didn't see the feet, which I saw the foot, and when he was sliding in, before he went and swung his glove over to his sleeve here, I saw his left foot already touching the plate. If that's the case, the guy is safe. I didn't see anything else that will give him or draw him to the conclusion that this guy got tagged out. You know, And again, you got some hardy announcers who really didn't look at it either. 
as carefully as we looked at it there that find out what was the defined area where he was talking about where he was being touched out here. And, and so it's there, you know, may, do TV need to do a little better job in instant replay? I think so, because really the fans are really dependent on that. Do we need to find some proof or some validation to some of these calls here from Secaucus, New York? Yes, we do. I think somewhere down the line, the networks have to get together with Major League Baseball and show what they define to be the the effortless call, which took, by the way, about three minutes and 40, 48 seconds for something that only takes both to be less than two minutes. And they have a clock in every single uh, stadium, uh, bridge, or whatever it may be, timing this thing out here. Um, something has to be done. Something has to be done quickly. In the meanwhile, the Tigers get a game robbed from them that was a very excitable home opener there. And it was excitable. A lot of comebacks and what it may be, I, you know, in the cold weather. So it's nothing really too much you can say about it. But, again, it's, what's done is done. But there needs to be, you know, a good quorum of people to get together and making sure the people that they hire is doing the right job. If they can't find it, inconclusive, it's a call. And whatever it was caught on the field is there. It is great topic, Butch and uh, Dave. We're going to have to uh, let you go. I know you have some studying you have to do, but before we let you go, Butch and I will continue here during the next segment talking about the Detroit sports scene. We'll also talk about the Michigan national championship game, and I want to kind of have a roundtable discussion with Butch on a certain topic in college basketball. But Dave, uh, before we let you go, give us an idea of what you have ahead. In uh, should say what you have in store for your shows over in Sioux, Ontario, and your thumbs up and thumbs down for the week, sir. Booyah, Scott. I'll start with that. Uh, uh, you know, I'll give a shout-out to the Villanova as well, winning the championship. I'll give them uh, – it's not Duke, but give credit where it was deserved, the juggernaut that they were at, uh, getting over Michigan. Uh, congratulations to them. But in terms of your uh, question, Scott, in terms of the show this week, we will be at Sports Center tomorrow. Uh, it'll be myself, Jamie Antonello, Dane Hancho is actually going to make his official last appearance on the Sports Center show until he goes back out to Red Lake and Dustin Gron, and we're going to talk basketball. We're going to talk a little bit of off-season football but that Jamie wants to bring to the table along with uh, college basketball discussion Then our newly implemented on the Canadian side here, the, the round table of sports. I'm going to bring up a variety of topics. And I can guarantee you that Don Cherry will probably be brought up at that table as well. And then Thursday at Boston hey. Pizza. I got myself, Justin Heichel, uh, will be there. Brad Cochmilio will not be uh, there this week because of the Hound game being Thursday night. He'll be quite occupied, and Dane being back out in Red Lake. So we, we plan to go over to the Hound game, then jump over to Boston Pizza, Justin and I. Uh, we're hoping that we get uh, a guest onto the show as well. Hoping Jamie Henderson can also come by as well. I'd like to get his take on the Don Cherry topic as well in the local sports scene and national sports scene. Uh, we also hope to have the T-shirts officially launched an image and also waiting to get the pictures to come in and our logo release that we hope to have in the coming weeks as well so lots going on and we'll be at sports center tomorrow at nine o'clock and we'll be at boston pizza on thursday at 9 30 or so so if anyone wants to come on down and enjoy some great food great beverages at both locations and maybe even if you yell in the background you might get on the show a little shout out to ej russell there uh you can be most welcomed and it'd be great to have you on board there you can hear those games at the gamesportshow.podbean.com or go to the webpage, thegamesportshow.com. Dave, thanks for joining us. We'll definitely look forward to your broadcast this week, and uh, go get some studying done, my friend. I feel like a child saying that, but you know what? Uh, dude, got to gotta get those extra grades to move up in the world. That's the way it goes, and I appreciate that, Scott and Butch. Nice talking to you, and we'll be back uh, uh, you know, chatting as soon as we can. All right, oh, Butch, yeah. uh, we're going gonna, we're gonna to lose Dave. Uh, final thoughts for him. Hey, uh, just be good here, man. Uh, you, you're striking up gold here, man. i got to get on one of them shows one of these doggone days here. Butch, you're more than welcome to come to the show anytime you want. Yeah, you got my email, I think, from Scott. If not, get Scott to send it over to you, and we'll get in contact and definitely get you on the show whenever you want, sir. You too, All right. Scotty. All right, sounds good, Dave, and we will talk to you uh, next week for sure here on The Game.
Perfect. Have a good night, fellas. The Wicked Sister, Sioux, Michigan. Check TripAdvisor, ranked right towards the top. Awarded the Certificate of Excellence, as well as voted number one pub in the UP. The Wicked Sister has managed to create a casual menu that offers unique, creative, and sometimes healthy offerings that rivals menu selections of any big city. Burgers and starters, snacks and shareables, soups and salads, sandwiches and tapas. On Ashman Street, Sioux, Michigan. Welcome to the Wicked Sister, where you'll be treated like family. Whether you like it or not. The Game Sports Show would like to thank an additional sponsor, an additional home to the Game Sports Show. Sports Center Bar and Grill. Sports Center Bar and Grill, located on 624 Wellington Street West, Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Sports Center rated top sports bar for the second year in a row. That Sports Center enjoyed their famous 75 cent wing night along with delicious Molson products on tap, along with a great atmosphere and other great food options available as well. Sports Center Bar and Grill, the Sioux's best sports bar. Thank you for tuning in to the game. Heard Monday nights from the Wicked Sister on Ashman Street on Eagle 95.1. Also online at RadioEagleSue.com and the podcast page, The Game Sports Show. Dot podbean dot com. I hope you're enjoying the broadcast. Now, if you want to hear more of the Twin Sioux's only local, regional, and national talk show, I encourage you to visit our website at thegamesportshow.com, and you can tune in to a pair of broadcasts of the Game Sports Show from Sioux, Ontario. Our co-host here on the game, Mr. Electric Avenue Dave McKegg, broadcasts the show on Wednesday night from Sports Center Bar and Grill in Sioux, Ontario, along with his regular contributors, Jamie Antonello, Justin Heichel, and Dean Hantro. They focus on football with their in the pocket segment talking about the NFL along with basketball and the NBA and other sports including tennis, golf, soccer and the WWE. If you like hockey, Thursday nights are for you as the game sports show is broadcasting from Boston Pizza in Sioux, Ontario with Dave McKegg along with his regular contributors Justin Heichel and Dane Hantro. Now this show focuses on hockey in the winter time and baseball in the summer and will include guests and interviews from local and national figures. Once again, you can hear three versions of the game at our website, thegamesportshow.com, or at the podcast page, thegamesportshow.podbean.com. Also on the podcast page, you will find selected audio broadcasts of Sioux Eagles home games, Brimley Bay's basketball, and Sioux High Blue Devil hockey, along with game contributor Butch Davis and his broadcasts of Butch on Sports. You can also find us on YouTube. Look for the Scott Nason channel. Thank you for listening, and keep it locked here to the game for all your local, regional, and national sports talk that you just can't get enough of. Welcome back to the game on Eagle 95.1. Scott Nason broadcasting from Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Still waiting for that snow that they predicted. It's starting to come down a little bit. Hopefully it won't come down anymore as we're joined once again by Butch Davis from the Telegram News and Butch on Sports. Uh, Butch, has it stopped raining down your way? Not yet. <laughs> and we need uh, spring bat up here. we still got snow on the ground. Oh, boy. That's that's. We're still cold as I don't know what here. It's been freezing around here, buddy. And, you know, the Easter Bunny went hit here. You know, he, he went home to eat at Joe's here. I don't know, man. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, Easter was pretty wicked here. I was here too, Butch. Let's continue here as uh, we had to do the roundtable a little bit earlier. And uh, coming up after our segment, we're going to have a special guest, one of my longtime friends, Dr. Steve Bigelow, he's a Michigan grad. He's going to have a lot to say about the Michigan game as well as just sports in high schools. He's the superintendent of Bay City Schools, and so I wanted to get him on for his perspective from an administrator's position as far as high school sports. So we'll have fun with Steve in our final segment. Always have fun with Butch in this segment. So, Butch, let's continue. Well, we got to talk about the big game last night as the Michigan Wolverines took on Villanova in men's basketball, the NCAA final, and, well, it was 31 points from the big ragu, Dante DiVincenzo. I think I butchered that name, a la Dave McKegg, as he came off the bench scoring 31 points as Michigan lost by the score of 79-62, to Villanova winning their second title in three years. Michigan has now lost four of their last four trips to the final game. Uh, Butch, did you have a chance to watch that game, and what are your thoughts? 
<laughs> well, folks, it, this is a case of somebody who wants to win it bad enough versus we're just glad to be here. Yep. And it looked like the University of Michigan was just glad to be there. They kept it competitive for a, a little while, up to maybe 25 points or so there. But after that, Villanova got their juices flowing there. And this guy, they just couldn't seem to have uh, an idea to guard this guy or knock him down and do something here to kind of make the, the game kind of rugged because Villanova was – doing an excellent job on Michigan, making it rugged for them. Um, and all in all, uh, I guess the best team won. Villanova is the best team of college basketball, maybe. Uh, I'm quite sure there's a, uh, a bunch of doggone teams are in line saying that we can beat that team if given the opportunity and the chance. And again, I've been harping this particular conversation on because I haven't been very happy with how they see and how they pick and what they do and how they do it. Well, again, these are the two that were left. It was a pretty doggone good game for a minute. But out of the, all the games that we saw during these last three weeks, where they were very exciting games, they were edge of your seat game. This is a big, big reason why people watch uh, the Final Four, watches the Sweet 16, watches the 64 and also watch the, maybe the pre-games of the two, four or five teams uh, going at it, trying to get into the doggone dance. So I'm telling you, 66 other teams would, would love to be in Michigan's shoe right now. They were not. So I think Michigan is going to tip their hat off and say they're a job well done. They can't really uh, take off. And, and, again, this goes to the media, too, to kick off on the Big Ten the way they have and to treat the – but this particular conference, the way they have been doing there, it just is is outrageous. But again, uh, congratulations to Michigan and also to Villanova for a great game. Butch, I wanted to add one thing during the roundtable. We didn't have enough time. Uh, and it has to do with college basketball, and I want your thoughts on this. Uh, this year's NIT won by Penn State. Uh, we're not going to talk about the NIT, but uh, what, what I wanted to talk about is they did some rules modifications. Now, you see some of these modifications in the women's game, and congratulations to Notre Dame for winning their title. But one of the things this year's NIT did is they made a few rule changes. And I want your thoughts on this because I think these are all very good ideas. Uh, first of all, they moved the three-point line back to the international line at 22 feet, 1.75 inches, almost two feet back from where it is in college basketball. They widened the free throw lane from 12 feet to 16 feet, which is consistent with what the NBA uses right now. They don't have two halves. They had two, or excuse me, four 10-minute quarters as opposed to two 20-minute halves, what I like is the teams will shoot two free throws beginning with the fifth foul of each quarter. So unlike college basketball, where it's after the seventh foul, it resets after the quarter and starts over, so you have less free throws, and the shot clock resets to 20 seconds after an offensive rebound instead of the full 30 seconds. Now, the NCAA playing rules process has a two-year cycle, and so they won't have any changes this upcoming year, but the next possible rules change date is May of 2019. So I guess I want your thoughts butch as far as some of those ideas any of those that you are for or against or just your thoughts in general well i was for everything but the clock okay the clock is that's a that's a that's a wacky one i think the clock needs to stay at 30 seconds okay i agree for one uh, now being the line being pulled back uh yes that has been a discussion from a whole lot of media people that i have um i have talked to and yes i think it's time that we pull that line back to the NBA level here, okay? Now, maybe not the international level, per se. If you want to tease it a little bit, you can put it at the international level, but these kids are NBA inclined. That's what they see. That's what they connect with. Uh, let's put the line back to the NBA uh, line. The three-throw line and whatnot, that was perfect, too. That's close to the NBA uh, rules and regulations. The quarters broken down. I like that considerably because, again, we don't have to worry about every five or ten of, or, or six minutes these automatic timeouts being given or, or being taken away from teams because they want to run commercials and therefore thou. Okay, uh, I think it's sickening. I think it's stupid. Uh, the ten-minute quarter is quicker. It's, it's more robust. Um, and, and again, you can kind of set yourself up more of a intelligent game in, in, instead of running the team down to the ground in in 20 minutes there. So 
I'm all in favor of those rules, except for the clock. I think the clock should stay at 30 seconds. I agree with you, Butch. Let's uh, move on to baseball. You talked about opening day with the Detroit Tigers. Well, the Tigers were in action this afternoon, and another impressive starting pitching performance by Matthew Boyd today as uh, he only gave up one run, but the Tigers didn't get any runs, and they lose for the second time this year by the score of one to nothing over the Kansas City Royals to drop to 1-4 and four on the season. Uh, Butch, it's been tough playing conditions, and while the Tigers haven't had any breaks this season by far, your thoughts on the Tigers' uh, start so far? Well, I blame the LA just there for building that stadium the way they did, and yeah. again, I will always say that, you know, people don't put too much thought in what they do and how they do it sometimes. They took the thought is making money, and I can understand that completely because I'm quite sure the 600 people that came to the game today, which was a tragedy here, okay, uh, sure enough, they bought a lot of hot chocolate instead of a beer, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that costs way, way less here. So, it does. <laughs> and they probably water that down too here. But, <laughs> but uh, enough of being solved in Comerica Park. Uh, I, you know, the thought process is again, and and I can't understand why a stadium was not built in the complexity such as maybe in Milwaukee, uh, Houston, um, Seattle, which I'm very familiar with. Those they have, they build a stadium due to the climate uh, activity. When you have baseball players or human beings, for that matter, to come all the way from down south where they're enjoying 80, 70 degree weather constantly every day of the week for two months, and they come back up north only to freeze, okay? And I tell you right now, when you come back up north, 50 degrees is, is freezing to someone who's used to 80 and and 85 and 90 degrees here. And I, 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 the, the whole matter to me, it, it smells. And like the Tigers of years past, except for exception of a couple teams, and I say a couple, uh, they've always had the slow start, meaning the weather, okay? They seem not to hit, not the, not, you know, the pitching has always been halfway decent, but the hitting has not been, um, to up to par. Now you can't play rock 'em sock 'em robots in the cold. Okay, you have to somewhat confine your game to a small ball here, and that's something that right now I'm waiting for the Tigers management uh, to get itself in gear for that. If they're going to win some games with the players they have right now, which are still getting used to each other per se, uh, and and it shows in these first four or five games they have played this season that these players are not used to each other. Uh, as far as signaling, uh, as far as uh, catching balls, the Iglesias situation with a bad situation with Reyes uh, tripping over each other. That was non-communication at its finest. Uh, I think he really underestimated that Iglesias has a lot of range as a shortstop and will go far out in the outfield to catch a ball. This guy doesn't know that, although we're taught in baseball that the outfielder went on a fly ball has the right away at catching a ball. Now, that saying there, you know, that's where the management has to come on in and take charge of what's going on. And you got to look at, did Detroit do a very good job while they're in Florida? Of course, probably not, okay? And getting everyone ready to come up north and play some small ball or some good baseball. And they haven't done it right now. The hitting has been nowhere to be found. Uh, one particular day, uh, I say... Um, a couple games back where the Tigers actually really did some good hitting in the first game they did some really good hitting. But again, that is bad. Also what is bad that if you don't get to see it or pay any attention to it, it's men left on base. The Tigers are leading, leaving a whole heck of a lot of men on base. The first game of the season, uh, you know, they lost that game. But when you have 10 men left on base up to nine innings here, that's a bad situation and that all falls on the manager not being able to produce or get runs to be scored. If you got to place a bun in there or something of element of surprise, you have to do it. Runs are costly when you don't have them, and you let them just go away. And the Tigers right now, they're going to be some growing pains. But hopefully, hopefully the growing pains are not that bad 
where they can all jump on Ron Geinheimer because people are ready to jump on him uh, from the first day because he didn't come out for his interview. He was claimed he was too mad to be interviewed. But again, you know, when you got veteran uh, uh, media people here in Detroit and beyond, okay, to come in to watch the game, they want to, they want accountability to be done. And uh, many of the media, it was all right with me, of course, but again, many of the media people were very dischanted by him not showing up for the interview on that first game of the season. Butch Davis joining us on the game. Uh, Butch, two teams that are doing a lot of winning over the past week are two teams that likely won't be playing postseason. As at least the Detroit Red Wings won't be playing in the postseason. They have won three in a row as they won their last game at home against Ottawa, two to nothing. Jimmy Howard getting his first shutout of the season. They're in Columbus tonight. And the Detroit Pistons winning a couple games this weekend. Uh, their last one at Brooklyn. The Pistons uh, still have playoff possibilities, albeit uh, very slim ones. They'll host Philadelphia on Wednesday. So, Butch, uh, two teams that we haven't seen win a lot this season seem to be winning when maybe it doesn't count, uh, at least as far as the Wings. Your thoughts on both the Wings and Pistons, if there's much to say at this point? Well, the Wings in, in this particular situation, you kind of tip your head and say, hip, hip, hooray. You know, maybe these two guys are finding themselves and hopefully that they've been a good winner of getting to know each other a lot better, uh, having a good idea of who's going to be on the team and who's going to be uh, not off the team, per se, where these guys can get off on uh, maybe some time and during the off season and do some skating and some polishing up. And when they bring it into camp in Traverse City, they're ready to go and uh, know each other a lot better there. Uh, and we're talking about the young kids who are playing now. A significant amount of those kids are going to be back. So, and the shout out for Jimmy Howard, who's played fairly well for the Red Wings this year. You know, he can't help the mistakes and the things that have not been status quo for him during this particular time of season. For that matter, the whole season at large there. But again, uh, we, I kind of tip my hat off for them. Now for the Detroit Pistons per se, they have a dilemma here, second to none. Uh, there's a little bit of rivalry, you know, or I should not say rivalry, but a little bit of uncertainty here in Miami, Florida, as um, Whitehead was sat on the bench the last 21 minutes of the game when he should have been in there. And some interviews were done after the uh, particular, and seemed like he is pretty upset with Mr. Whitehead, that is, of the Miami Heat. And meanwhile, Detroit Pistons are going about their merry way Trying to sweep the rest of the of the of the schedule they have, if they have any, they're only four games back now from Miami, who holds that eight position in the playoffs. There, uh, this is going to be kind of wacky there, but uh, again, someone has to be failing pretty miserably for the Pistons to get in. I mean, if the Pistons get in, that means they have to win the rest of their game. Are they winnable? Yes, they are. However, uh, Miami and uh, I think um, the other team is Milwaukee. in there. Milwaukee right now are holding fort. And if they don't make any mistakes or at least win three of their next uh, four or five games, they should be secure and uh, the Pistons season will be over. Butch, uh, time for one more topic before we get to our thumbs up and thumbs down. And when we have our show Monday, we will be at the Wicked Sister this upcoming Monday, back at our normal home, back at our normal time, back at our normal night. We'll have watched WrestleMania, as WrestleMania will be on Sunday from New Orleans. SmackDown about set to get on the air here in a few minutes. Uh, Raw last night, uh, not a whole lot of real big news that came out of raw the undertaker still did not make an appearance uh likely will probably in my opinion will make an appearance in new orleans to take on john cena you had the big uh, uh the press conference i guess you can call it with kurt angle and ronda rousey and triple h and stephanie mcmahon as a uh, ronda rousey gets put through the table and a lot of other things that are going on uh butch we talked about it last week but we're getting ever closer the road to WrestleMania just five days away. What's your thoughts going in? Uh, excitement, but I think the WWE is doing too much of trying to sell the bad boy, which tells me they're having a problem with maybe people watching this on the WWE network there. 
and it's reflecting from SmackDown and Raw doing a, too many uh, studio bits instead of showing out some great, great wrestling there. That's how you're going to get them to watch uh, WrestleMania there. They're not going to watch it through you trying to sell uh, these matches, which you're taking 10, 15. I mean, the first uh, uh, part of the show is like we see it, 17 minutes were gone from the Stephanie McMahon and uh, Ronda Rossi and uh, Kurt Angle deal there before they went to commercial break or yep. put somebody to a table. Um, <laughs> If this is all we waited for here. They could have did that in the beginning five minutes, and that's it. And let them go about their business. But and you're going to see that probably on SmackDown tonight. A lot of selling of the product that um basically they're trying to get everybody to watch. But again, um, it's going to be pretty wicked. Uh, the big man per se. He came out there looking at the bronze and the brains. Okay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that was. <clears throat> that's some of the things I'm talking about right now. Because unless this guy got a twin brother here, it's not going to be real here. You know, I, I, I was hoping they name um, a partner which can somewhat be considerably out there. Because you know doggone well he's not going to play a, a, do a tag team match by himself there. Um, unless some dirty tricks go above and beyond the call of duty at WrestleMania, which I don't think a lot of people are going to really be able to take in into consideration, but ah, it's about now, you know, let's let's get the show on the road. That's what I'm looking at right now here. I kind of agree there. I agree completely again, Butch. It, it is time. It's, it's been a long road, and, you know, they, they, something needs to happen because I think yeah. in a lot of cases they're just kind of going through the motions in certain uh, parts exactly. of these storylines. Let's get to our thumbs up and thumbs down for the week, Butch, and uh, both my thumbs up have to do with family members. First of all, thumbs up uh, who is in the house tonight, my son Vance, as uh, he won yet again our bracketology for college basketball, picking Villanova to win the national championship after picking North Carolina last year. This is his first two times filling out brackets, Butch. He's he's picked the correct uh, team to win twice. The last time I've done it, 2003. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. That's what I say, so uh, I'll oh. be using him. And a uh, thumbs up to my mom and dad, Roy and Janet Nason. They actually had dinner tonight down at the Wicked Sister, our normal home of the game, which will be back on Monday, celebrating their 46th anniversary tonight. So happy anniversary, Mom and Dad. And thumbs down just to this weather. It's April for crying out loud. I am probably going to have my entire umping schedule, possibly in the month of April, wiped out because they are nowhere near having fields uh, ready for play. Heck, we got to get the snow off the fields here in the UP. So a thumbs down to old man winter, mother nature, whichever one, enough. We need some sunshine. We need some warm temperatures. Heck, we need temperatures above freezing up here, Butch. Butch Davis, your thumbs up and thumbs down for the week, sir. No, no, no. Don't do the down cherry. <laughs> no, no, we won't. <laughs> Dave covered that, I think, pretty extensively, oh, Butch. Boy. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Oh, boy. Let's see. Thumbs down. I don't give a do thumbs down. Thumbs down for that fine of official in Secaucus, New York, who basically said the band was safe when when the dog on play were inconclusive. There, I'm, I'm just, I'm just nerves. My nerves are gone. Okay, I tell you. Brutal. <laughs> Well, they did. It's a brutal day for people to come back there for a second day of getting drunk and uh, having fun downtown Detroit here. Um, of course, the first day, by golly, you know, <coughs> I did not mention um, it was many people out there enjoying the rain. They thought the game should have been played. Yeah, a lot of people <laughs> thought that. You're right. I kind of agree with them, too. Uh, <laughs> uh, thumbs up. Uh, I think thumbs up has to go definitely to um, hmm, girls basketball here. You know, the girls basketball game, Notre Dame, and uh, I watch, um, oh, what's the other team here? Uh, Mississippi, Mississippi State. State. I'm sorry, Mississippi State. That was uh, one of the best games I've seen in a long, long time. And I watched it for practically two games in a row. Or uh, maybe uh, that that particular Sunday and 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 Saturday and Sunday and boy, I saw some good 
old time smoker. Congratulations to Notre Dame on that one. That young lady who busted that the hoop twice, she's gonna have all kind of friends until she graduates. I tell and you. That's some. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I want to meet her too. Too. <laughs> and me get a taste. <laughs> oh boy. Shoot, boy, but all kind of good food and stuff going to be coming her way, I tell you. <laughs> good stuff for Butch Davis, as always. Butch, before we let you go, uh, what's your thoughts for the week? Or I should say not your thoughts, but what are your plans are as far as coverage before we have our show Monday night back at the Wicked Sister? Well, this is the one thing we're going to be talking about today. Uh, maybe tonight or Wednesday morning on Butch on Sports is the classification of uh, Michigan sports has yes. been dealt with here. And there's some moves been made as far as people getting pulled up and teams getting pulled down. We'll discuss those particular teams and what harm or what good is going to be doing. River Rouge is one of those teams, especially has been a Class B team since I can remember. They are now a Class A team. So either the enrollment has grown, and I can see that from many um uh, people, uh, kids coming from the southwestern area where I used to live at because I'm not too far from Rich. Or, matter of fact, Rich is the closest school to me, but I'm in Detroit. So that made a big difference when me going to Detroit Southwestern via go across the border to another school. There was no school of choice at that particular time. So either private school or that school there, that's where it went there. But we'll be talking about that throughout the week as well as uh, touching on the Detroit Tigers, the Pistons. And uh, we give our, our salute to Detroit Red Wings, which their season going to be over in a few shakes. You can find Butch's show, Butch on Sports, on the podcast page of this show, the Game Sports Show. Podbean.com, or you can find it at his podcast page. That's Simply Butch 2, T O O. Podomatic.com. Butch, have a great rest of your week and weekend. We'll talk to you Monday night from the Wicked Sister for our normal show location and time thanks for joining us and uh enjoy the rest of your week sir uh, you do the same now here Good. blow away the snow here and put some heat down there here bring some heat up here too you're certainly going to try so butch and uh thanks again for joining us we'll talk to you next week all right talk to you all right, we'll be back with our final guest, uh, Dr. Stephen Bigelow, Michigan grad, all-around good guy. We're going to talk to him about the Michigan National Championship and high school sports from an administrator's perspective. That's coming up on the game here on Eagle 95.1. Get Wicked at Wicked Sister. You'll find the best tasting food for you and your family. Start off with some wicked appetizers like the crab dip served with soft pretzel bites and warm non-bread strips and delicious boneless chicken wings that are antibiotic and hormone free with five choices of sauces. Try the barbecue pulled pork sandwich or the number one selling drunken cow burger and the chicken caprice flatbread. Check out the Wicked Sister gluten free menu and catering. The Wicked Sister, downtown Ashman Street seven days a week the game sports show would like to thank a list of additional sponsors north shore sports and auto new location located on 647 mcdonald avenue sault st marie a family owned and operated business with doing business in sault st marie for over 10 years loads of products available for your enjoyment for all seasons north shore sports and auto we understand the importance of quality service and products and we work hard to ensure that all customers have a positive experience before and after each and every sale north shore sports and auto meaning all of your new and pre-owned equipment needs special thanks to the salon the salon located on 589 second line east to st marie ontario owned and operated by mike Cuglietta. book your appointment today at 705-941-9191 or via online at https colon dash dash the salon dot as dot me dash the salon making the suit beautiful one haircut at a time as well as a shout out to the superior pro shop the superior pro shop located inside a community first credit union superior arena on 285 Northern Avenue East, to St. Marie, Ontario. Owned and operated by Jeremy Paquin and ran by Larry Monroe. Superior Pro Shop for over 40 years meet all of your skate sharpening, skate repair, and hockey needs. Also to Discover the Canvas. Discover the Canvas. Located on 317 Wellington Street West, to St. Marie, Ontario. A beautiful new renovated building owned and operated by expert artist and Sioux native Katrina Tipito. Katrina taking her talents of the ink in Sioux St. Marie and truly creating the best and most realistic art locally. Call Katrina today at 705-450-8099 or email her at discoverthecanvas at gmail.com to book your tattoo or consultation today.
welcome back to the game on Eagle 95.1. Scott Nason broadcasting from Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan on this now snowy Tuesday night in early April. I want to thank our guests so far tonight, Dave McKegg from Sioux, Ontario, and Butch Davis from the Metro Detroit sports area. And now we are joined by Steve Bigelow. He is a superintendent, or the superintendent, from Bay City for the Bay City Public Schools. He's also a longtime friend of mine, actually one of my longest-running friends, going all the way back to elementary school. Uh, first of all, Steve, thanks for joining us here on the game. And, uh, boy, do you miss this northern Michigan weather in April? Oh, I, I miss having snow at this time of year so much. Actually, the, the weather's not a whole lot better uh, down here right now. But, yeah, I, I do. I, I do want to clarify, though, we were actually friends before elementary school as well. It started in uh, 1979. What do you think of that? I started in the Carter administration. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You were just you a little Democrat Carter, running around listener town. Here, Don Supa, somebody you know very well, Steve. Oh, I know Don. Uh, he listens to the show. Probably two of my longest running friends. And uh, I, w- I was telling Don that you're going to be on the show. And I go back to it. And that wants me to lead you into talking about the University of Michigan. Of course, you went to school at the University of Michigan. That's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on here was because we have a lot of University of Michigan fans up here. And they are dubbed by many Walmart Wolverine fans, uh, due to the fact that if you go into Walmart, not a sponsor of the show, I might add, you will not find any Michigan State apparel, but you'll find lots of Michigan apparel. So we call those that didn't go to University of Michigan the Walmart Wolverine fans. Of course, you could say the same of Michigan State. I didn't go to Michigan State, but I'm a Michigan State fan. The problem is you can't find clothing in Walmart for Michigan State, which I still have a problem for. Getting back to my point, uh, there was a trip that Don and I made there while you were going to school where we visited you, and, well, we saw a, well, rather lackluster Michigan State performance against Michigan back when they actually were winning big games in football, Steve. I know that was a long time ago, but that's when they were (laughs) winning big games. And do you remember that trip? I remember that trip very well. And I, I got to tell you, I actually grew up as a Michigan State fan like you, though, because, you know, my she sister did. went to Michigan State. And uh, I, I didn't become a Michigan fan until I actually ended up going there. But I remember that trip incredibly well. And uh, it was a great time to be going to school there as well, because Michigan did not lose to Ohio State then. Um, they ended up getting the national championship in 98. Um, I mean, it was just an incredible time, and they had a hockey powerhouse at the time, too, which I'm hoping they will again this year. We'll have to see. But, uh, yeah, I remember you and Don spending a, a fabulous uh, weekend, and we've got to be careful with some of the stories that might come out of this. So, so you know, we've got to be careful there. Selective editing goes on in the game, Steve. I can assure <laughs> you. Right. Let's get to the game last night. As I know you were watching, despite your busy schedule in Bay City, the Michigan Wolverines, uh, a very successful season. No two ways about it. And, you know, they ran up against a buzzsaw in Villanova. Villanova winning that game last night and the men's national championship. But the University of Michigan has a lot to hang their hat on. They won 33 games. They've never done that as uh, in, their, in their school's history. And, you know, it was uh, maybe... Not a surprise that they got to the final, but, you know, you look at the beginning of the year, the preseason top 25 rankings, they were nowhere to be found. Michigan State's number two, and they were eliminated on the first week. And uh, thoughts on the game last night, Steve, and just thoughts on the Michigan season in general. I mean, you got to love your coach, John Beeline. I'm not a Michigan guy, but I'm a big Beeline guy. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of his as well. And I'll start off with the season. I did not think that they would have that successful of a season this year, certainly, but one of the, the turnaround points for me was their first uh, game against Michigan State. I was sure that Michigan State was going to, to beat Michigan, and, you know, Michigan ended up doing okay. And I thought, well, maybe it's a fluke. And then ended up happening again a little bit later on in the season. I thought, well, maybe something's here, because I, I thought Michigan State truly was the team to watch this year. I, I really did. And as you could just sense that momentum picking up. And then, you know, obviously getting in the tournament, uh, getting through the Big Ten was was huge. Going into tournament time, you could feel the momentum. Uh, just to be very honest, though, I did not believe that they were going to come out on top against Villanova. I, Villanova looked so ridiculously good. It, it was They are the, the Alabama of basketball. I mean, you know, they could just annihilate anybody that they're playing. And, again, watching the very beginning of the game last night, uh, I thought, wow, maybe maybe something's actually going to happen here. Uh, Villanova was not able to drop some of those threes. They just weren't getting the shots. 
and then the wheels came off a little bit. And I don't know if you remember this, but I get nervous watching games. I have a hard time sticking with it. And so you remember what, what I do is I get up and uh, this is going to sound terrible, but I actually turn the channel <laughs> at that point. I either usually go to my two go tos are uh, our uh, antique road show <laughs> or um, are also antique pickers. I'm a huge curb fan, but yeah, I do something to take my mind off of it. And then I check the score on Twitter and uh, see what's going on. And then I end up going back and forth between the game, but it was a, an incredible, incredible effort. I couldn't be more proud of the team, just a solid group of guys. And uh, I really do believe, you know, you talked about beeline. Uh, I attribute their success to just having a phenomenal coach. Uh, it really was coaching ability that got them this far. And, you know, looking at the two schools in Michigan, Michigan State and Michigan, I mean, Michigan State seems to get the the high-end guys that, you know, you look at this year's team. I mean, Miles Davis, who personally I think is a little overrated, but you have three guys that are probably going to be drafted in this upcoming draft. And then you have Michigan. They seem to get guys that fit more the system of beeline. I mean, you look at Wagner. I mean, nobody heard of this guy. He's probably going to exactly. go to the NBA draft coming up here in a moment or coming up here in a couple months. But, you know, I think beeline maybe looks for players for more for his system. And it seems like Michigan State just seems to want to get the, the high-end guys. And it obviously hasn't worked out for Michigan State. I mean, they haven't been to the Sweet 16 in the last three years, and they haven't been to the Final Four in quite a few. Michigan's been to three Final Fours here in, in five years. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I still view Michigan State as a little bit more of a perennial powerhouse in, in basketball here lately, but that is a good point. I mean, Michigan has come on strong the last couple of years, and I've noticed that too. Uh, State seems to get some more attractive players coming through. Um I think with any coach, though, they're they're mainly looking for kids that they know are going to be coachable and are going to work with their system. Uh, and you know how cyclical it is as well. Sometimes you just never you just never know. Um, but uh, I, I was shocked Michigan State did not have as much success as they did this year. To be perfectly honest with you. And Steve, I, I made a mistake. It's not Miles Davis. I think he plays Trump, and I was talking about Miles Bridges. Somebody that was <laughs> I know you Yeah, you can appreciate that little slip up. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Nice. <laughs> Steve, I wanted to talk to, to you uh, about high school sports. Now, you've been superintendent of Bay City Schools, public schools here this year. You've also uh, worked in the Metro Detroit area. And so you're very familiar with the role of high school sports uh, in a school. I mean, obviously, it, it's very big. Academics, of course, come first. But, you know, there's there's a lot to be said about high school sports. And I guess we haven't had a, a superintendent on the show before. So I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts in general on how important high school sports are in your school and at least, you know, just in your experience. I mean, it's something that we cover on a daily basis here on the game, and it's something that I officiate. I do high school umpiring for baseball and softball, which I'll probably get about a week season here looking out the window. But just your thoughts on high school sports in a school environment. How important is it to you? Well, I'll tell you, as a uh, longtime high school principal in, in the metro Detroit area with some very competitive teams, um, it was incredibly important that we provided solid coaching. And my my focus was never on finding a coach to make sure that we were going to have a, you know, a state championship caliber team. It was really finding somebody who's going to do the best job working with those kids and making sure that they're supporting the role of student athletes. So I always looked at it from that angle. If I have a great coach and they have a losing season, I was always okay with that. It all came down to how people were being treated. Um, obviously the, the intangibles that you can pick up some of those soft skills in being involved in high school athletics are enormous um, from teamwork to perseverance and some of those skills. If you've got a coach that's willing to, to push uh, players to go a little bit further to, to work as a, a team towards a common goal, that is absolutely priceless. Um, when we get into deals where, you know, recruiting issues with, with high school sports, which obviously shouldn't happen, but we know that it does. I, I do have a, a big problem with that. Um, and to me, it's important that students are, are at the school attending because they're for academics first. And certainly it's important that you have an attractive athletic program because you want people to, to want to attend your school, especially in this, this day and age of school of choice. But uh, my thought was always, as long as you are providing 
solid services academically and through the, the fine arts as well, uh, sports are going to follow right along with that. You're going to attract a, a higher quality program. Um, and it, it's, as you know, in the Metro Detroit area, it's, it's especially competitive. And I'll tell you where I am right now in, in Bay City in the uh, Great Lakes Bay region, it's competitive as well. In my own school district, we actually have two comprehensive high schools. We have Bay City Western and Bay City Central, and they're both very, very competitive high schools. And then we have an alternative high school as well. And uh, there are a lot of eyes going on in, in the Bay City area about how some of our our neighboring schools are in a lot of tough competition. Uh, our, we had an incredible girls basketball team this year that ended up losing um, to Saginaw Heritage towards the end. So a lot of talent, but again, it really does come down to making sure that you're supporting them as, as students first and athletes second. Uh, it's not so much the, the kids that are the problem, Scott, and you probably know this. Usually sometimes our biggest issues are with parents that seem to forget that we are not professional sports, but <laughs> we're running a high school, and uh, most of these kids are not going to make it on to the college level, um, and if they do, that's that's far and few between. The part that concerns me, and you know, things were certainly very different when we were kids, but you and I, I mean, we used to hang out outside playing pickup ball, uh, basketball in my driveway. We'd go find a, a wiffle ball game somewhere. Uh, we were always doing that kind of stuff, and I am concerned at the level of organization, that organized sports that go on right now, um, and the specialization that happens. I think there was a lot to be learned from being a three-sport athlete or, or trying some different things out, just becoming a better, well-rounded person, and I just see the specialization that's going on everywhere, and something just doesn't seem right. It, it seems like a little bit too, it's too much pressure, and I don't know if it's uh it's the best for the kids. I, I don't know if you picked up on that as well, but to me that seems like a bit of an issue. It's funny you say that, Steve, because I was having the same conversation with my parents here over Easter and, and talking about hockey. Now, you played basketball. I played yep. hockey. Poorly, I might add, in my case, playing I hockey. I wasn't that great at One basketball. things <laughs> that happened then compared to now is hockey was during the hockey, traditional hockey season. You started maybe in October, you played till March, and you were done. You had the occasional hockey camp that you might go to Lake Superior State University or over to Sioux Canada. Now there's spring hockey leagues, there's summer hockey leagues, there's fall hockey leagues. And you know this town, Steve, uh, we, we're called Hockey Town USA. No offense to Detroit, but we were the original Hockey Town USA. And the amount of politics and drama that goes on in our local hockey association would would shock probably many of your listeners that might tune into this show down in the Bay City or Metro Detroit area. And and I think you hit the nail on the head. It's there's the special specialization. Uh, you don't have a lot of those three sport athletes. Uh, you do in the smaller schools around here because there's just not a lot of athletes that can make up a team. But you have a lot of people that just play the one sport, maybe two and you yep. have a lot of specialization, I would totally agree. And the other thing I think you find, Steve, and I'm pretty sure it's probably the same in your area, talking to Butch, I know it's very uh, very much the same down there, is just you can't get a lot of good people to come out and coach. And we're talking at the right. youth levels, we're talking at the junior varsity, the middle school, and the varsity level, because as you well know, being a superintendent, you're – you're going to hear from a lot of parents, and a lot of parents are going to have problems with what the coach does. A lot of parents are going to have problems with how much their kid gets playing time. They're going to have problems with officials, and it just, I think it drives a lot of good people away from from coaching, from participating in youth sports, and it certainly drives a lot of officials away as uh, there's a big shortage of officials around the state of Michigan. Uh, myself, uh, this would be my sixth year, believe it or not, officiating uh, high school baseball and softball. I've had a ton of games, and it's even more a uh, problem, I think, in the basketball and football. A lot of these guys that have done it for a while are retiring, and a lot of guys that are younger than me don't want any part of it because, you know, you see it at the lower levels, especially Little League. I mean, you, some of my yeah. worst officiating experience have been in Little League tournaments and what yeah, the have done there. So I know I covered a lot of ground there, Steve, but, uh, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head. Specialization is, is really hurting, I think, high school sports. Well, and just the idea of the sportsmanship from the parents. I mean, you, you talked about, you know, your experiences in Little League. Uh, last thing you want to do when you're out there trying to help kids is have to parent parents. You know, they're out there just saying incredibly destructive things, uh, and I'm not sure what, what good that does. One of my most frustrating experiences, first of all, you talked about the political side of hockey. I found that that's with, with every sport, and it's 
it's amazing how deep it, it goes. But, uh, you know, from from AAU uh, athletics that are pulling kids away from some of the school programs that are out there, it, it, it really is, um, I, I don't know, I, I, have, I have a lot of problems with some of the experiences because you end up having these, sometimes you end up with high school teams that are really a reflection of the AAU team just simply playing at the high school and moving through. And I wonder what that does for, for some of the experiences of kids who maybe back in the day would have had, had an opportunity on that school team and and are now shut out from it as well. One of my worst experiences, though, Scott, um, was actually when I was a principal, and I had to uh, fill in uh, to supervise a high school soccer game, and I'd never seen anything like that. It certainly changed from <laughs> when we were uh, little playing soccer, but my gosh, the behavior of the parents. I, I ended up uh, kicking out an entire sideline of, of parents just because the – just because the behavior was so ridiculous. But what shocked me is it almost seemed to be accepted in high school soccer. It, it was kind of like, you know, when you watch TV and you're seeing people take dives, and, and which drives me crazy, and, and fake the injuries, that, that somehow seeped down to the high school level. <laughs> and the parents are, are going along with it. So yeah. it is. It's, it's very, very frustrating. Steve Bigelow joining us on the game. Uh, Steve, I want to thank you for coming on, and we would love to have you on again from time to time, maybe to talk about things going on in Detroit, Michigan, or just high school sports in general. You got it. It's a it's a real p- privilege, and uh, I love talking to you, too. Yeah, it's, it's Absolutely. To uh, great to hear, hear from you, as always, and uh, we'll uh, let you know when this show is posted. It'll be on later tonight. You can share it with your listening audience. And, uh, Steve, we appreciate you being on. Uh, stay warm down there. We'll try to stay warm up here, and uh, we'll talk to you soon on the game. Okay, great. Take care, Scott. And thank you, Steve. And uh, before we let you go, I want to thank each and every one of you for listening tonight. I want to thank Butch Davis and Dave McKegg for joining us. Don't forget, Dave McKegg will have his show from Sports Center Bar and Grill on Thursday night, rather Wednesday night, uh, talking NBA, talking all sorts of sports. And then Thursday night from Boston Pizza, Dave and the gang will have another show talking about sports. NHL, NOJHL, OHL, Major League Baseball, and more. And we'll be back at the Wicked Sister on Monday night at 6 o'clock. And you can listen to all shows on thegamesportshow.podbean.com or by going to the webpage, thegamesportshow.com. That's going to do it here from Eagle 95.1. We'll talk to you next Monday on the game. Have a great night.